Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story. This haunted hotel had some strange rules I had to follow. I had recently taken up a job as a night security guard at the old Belmont Hotel. Rumors had circulated about strange occurrences and ghostly apparitions haunting the halls. I don't believe in paranormal stuff. Nothing crazy ever happened to me. So I went to the hotel to start my first night. The ambient was, to say the least, very strange. The hotel looked pretty old and almost abandoned. That gave me a first bad impression of the place. But I didn't care about this because as everyone says, don't judge a book by his cover. So I fastly moved on and went to the manager's office to get the instructions I needed for the shift. The manager looked pretty nice. The office was pretty different from the rest of the hotel, and this room looked a bit more modern. Without giving me chance to properly introduce myself correctly, he instantly handed me a set of rules, emphasizing their importance for my safety. I glanced at the sheet that looked kinda normal at first, and as I made my way to the tiny security guard office, my eyes narrowed as I read the instructions. Rule 1. Never leave the security office unless it's time for a routine check. Under no circumstances should you wander the hotel alone. Rule 2. Take a walk around each floor every hour. If it takes longer than 15 minutes, seek refuge in a nearby room until the time is up. Rule 3. Answer all calls coming through the security room phone. If it's a staff member, continue the conversation. Otherwise, Hang up immediately. Rule 4. If you hear knocking on the security office door, hide in the nearby storage closet and do not open the door. Rule 5. If you hear unusual sounds like crying or laughter during your rounds, return to the security office promptly. Rule 6. If you spot a shadowy figure on the security cameras or during your rounds, close your eyes, turn away, and seek shelter in the nearest vacant room. If no rooms are available, count a 360 and then open your eyes. Rule 7. Camera May 9th Capture Disturbing Images When alerted by a low-pitched beep, maintain unwavering focus on the camera until it turns off. Rule 8. As your shift nears its end, resist the urge to fall asleep. Stay awake and alert at all costs. Rule 9. Keep this sheet of paper with you at all times. It holds crucial information. The manager assured me that the rules were essential for my safety, but doubts crept into my mind. Was this just an elaborate prank to test my nerves? Regardless, I decided to heed the instructions, reminding myself it was better to be safe than sorry. Hours passed in monotonous routine. I completed my rounds, checked the cameras, and resisted the creeping drowsiness that threatened to overtake me. As the clock struck 3 a.m., a piercing ring startled me from my weariness. I picked up the phone, my heart racing. Hello? I answered cautiously. A voice crackled on the other end. It's Emily, the night receptionist. I need your help. Something's not right here. My breath caught in my throat. Was Emily in danger? I glanced at the cameras, hoping to catch a glimpse of any unusual activity. Yet, everything appeared normal. I couldn't ignore her plea for assistance. What's happening, Emily? Are you okay? I asked, my voice filled with concern. But before she could respond, an eerie silence fell over the line. Then, a low growl reverberated through the receiver followed by Emily's blood-curdling scream. The call abruptly ended, leaving me paralyzed with fear. I dropped the phone immediately. What happened to Emily? Is she okay? Is this part of the prank? I couldn't think correctly at that moment. All I knew is that maybe, if I don't follow the rules, things can go very wrong. 
Something is not right here. After what happened to Emily, I really needed to know if she's safe. I needed to confirm that nothing wrong is happening in here, and it's just a product of my imagination. I knew outside could be dangerous, and the set of rules that I were given were spinning on my head these hours. Against my better judgment, I stepped out of the security office, gripping the rules tightly in my hand. The hotel corridors stretched out before me, shrouded in darkness. As I made my way to the reception area, an unsettling silence hung in the air. The dim lights flickered, casting eerie shadows on the walls. Each step I took echoed through the empty halls, amplifying my unease. The rules, now crumpled in my hand, reminded me of the precautions I should have followed. But it was too late to turn back now. Reaching the reception desk, I saw no sign of Emily. The area was abandoned, with the desk covered in a layer of dust. A cold chill crawled up my spine, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. That strange feeling when you're in a corridor and you have many doors around you, feeling that something is about to jump from some of those doors. A sudden movement caught my attention from the corner of my eye. I turned toward the hotel's grand staircase and there, standing at the top, was a woman in a tattered white gown. Her long, disheveled hair cascaded down her shoulders, and her pale face wore an expression of eternal sorrow. Fear gripped my heart as she descended the stairs, her ghostly form gliding silently toward me. It was as if time had slowed down, each step she took filling me with a growing sense of dread. I struggled to recall the rules, my mind clouded with panic. Just as the apparition reached the final step, I remembered Rule 6. Rule 6. If you spot a shadowy figure on the security cameras or during your rounds, close your eyes, turn away, and seek shelter in the nearest vacant room. If no rooms are available, count a 360 and then open your eyes. I closed my eyes and turned away, seeking refuge in the nearest vacant room. My heart pounded in my chest as I entered the room and locked the door behind me. Inside the room, I took a moment to catch my breath. The silence was deafening, and the only light came from the flickering bulb above. I wondered how long I should wait, how long until the threat had passed. Minutes passed like hours, and my mind raced with uncertainty. Should I dare to peek outside? Would the ghostly figure still be there, waiting to claim me as its next victim? The rules seemed both a guide and a curse, offering guidance yet plunging me further into the unknown. The curiosity won and I didn't wait it more. I approached the door and slowly turned the handle. As the door creaked open, a sense of relief washed over me. The hallway was empty, devoid of any supernatural presence. I cautiously stepped out, determined to continue my investigation. Now I knew that something was happening and that I needed to follow the rules if I didn't want to suffer the consequences. I retraced my steps, making my way toward the security office. Glancing at the cameras, I noticed a flicker on camera 9. A low-pitched loud beep filled the room, and my attention was drawn to the screen. A figure appeared, its features distorted and blurred, as if torn between realms. Then I remembered Rule 7. Rule 7. Camera May 9th Capture Disturbing Images When alerted by a low-pitched beep, maintain unwavering focus on the camera until it turns off. So I forced myself to maintain unwavering focus on the camera. The figure's presence grew more menacing, its gaze piercing through the screen, reaching into my very soul. Sweat trickled down my forehead as the seconds ticked by, the pressure and weight of the moment almost unbearable. I couldn't look anything else. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure vanished. The camera returned to its normal view, as if nothing had happened. I let out a shaky breath, grateful that I had followed the rules. But my relief was short-lived. 
A distant sound caught my attention, a soft, mournful cry echoing through the hotel. It seemed to come from the depths of the building, beckoning me toward an unknown fate. I followed the sound of the mournful cry, my heart pounding in my chest. Each step I took felt heavier, as if an invisible force sought to hold me back. The hotel's hallways twisted and turned, leading me deeper into its labyrinthine depths. As I ventured further, the air grew thicker, suffused with a sense of despair and dread. Shadows danced along the walls, whispering secrets I couldn't comprehend. The rules clutched tightly in my hand felt like my only lifeline, the thin barrier between the world of the living and the realm of the supernatural. Finally, I reached the hotel's abandoned ballroom. The once grand space now lay in ruins, its ornate chandeliers shattered, and the dance floor covered in a layer of dust and debris. But amidst the decay, a faint light flickered, drawing me toward its source. I approached cautiously, my footsteps muffled by the thick carpet. The light emanated from a small side room, its door slightly ajar. With a mixture of trepidation and morbid curiosity, I pushed the door open. What I witnessed inside was beyond comprehension. The room seemed to exist in a twilight realm, suspended between the living and the dead. The walls pulsed with an otherworldly energy, pulsating with eerie hues of blue and violet. A cold gust of wind swept through the chamber, chilling me to the bone. In the center of the room stood a figure, bathed in an ethereal glow. It was a woman, her features ethereal and translucent. Her eyes gleamed with an otherworldly light, and her flowing gown seemed to billow without the touch of wind. She reached out toward me, her hand beckoning, her voice a haunting melody. Driven by a mix of fear and a desire to uncover the truth, I approached the gramophone. As I drew nearer, the music intensified, its haunting notes reverberating through my very being. The room seemed to sway in rhythm, the walls pulsating with an otherworldly energy. With a trembling hand, I reached out to touch the gramophone. The moment my fingers made contact, a surge of energy coursed through me, jolting me backward. The music grew louder, more dissonant, as if it were trying to tear apart the fabric of reality itself. Suddenly, the gramophone exploded into a shower of shards, its pieces scattering across the room. A deafening silence followed, broken only by the sound of my own labored breathing. I stood amidst the wreckage, my heart pounding in my chest. From the shattered remnants of the gramophone emerged ghostly apparitions, each one a twisted reflection of the suffering souls that had been trapped within the hotel's walls. They reached out toward me, their spectral hands grasping for a hold on the physical realm. In a frenzy of panic, I stumbled backward, desperately trying to evade their touch. But they were relentless their translucent forms moving with an ethereal grace. One of them, a woman with hollow eyes and tattered clothing, lunged toward me, her outstretched hand inches from my face. Summoning every ounce of courage, I dodged her spectral grasp and sprinted toward the exit. The other apparitions pursued me, their wails and moans echoing through the corridors. Shadows writhed and twisted around me, threatening to ensnare me in their clutches. As I raced through the labyrinthine halls, I could feel the presence of the supernatural entities closing in. Their grotesque forms brushed against me, leaving a chilling residue on my skin. I could almost taste the despair that emanated from them, a bitter reminder of their eternal suffering. With each passing moment, the hotel itself seemed to come alive, its walls pulsating with a malevolent energy. Doors swung open and shut, revealing glimpses of spectral figures trapped in perpetual torment. 
The very fabric of reality was unraveling, and I was caught in its nightmarish grip. I could see a faint glimmer of hope, a flickering exit sign indicating the path to safety. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I pushed my body to its limits, desperate to outrun the relentless pursuit. Just as I reached the exit on the top of the building, the hotel seemed to convulse. The hour was now 6 a.m., unleashing a torrent of supernatural forces. The floor beneath me crumbled, revealing a chasm of darkness. With no time to spare, I leaped across the gaping void, narrowly escaping its clutches. Many hands emerged from the exit door at the roof, and then started appearing on the floor, blood stains, and more disgusting stuff that I don't want to mention. I almost vomited, but I knew I had to push my body to the limits to escape from here. The ghosts were all around me. All hope was lost. But I saw something white in the corner, and I fastly approached to it. It was a piece of paper that said the following. Rule 10. If you're reading this, you're probably on the roof, which means you probably got caught. If that's the case and only if ITS the case, jump off the roof. I hesitated to jump, it was too high and the floor was pure concrete, but then I felt many hands trying to grab my legs, I saw them, their faces corrupted by the most obscure presence that this building hides, people from all ages with their faces completely corrupted and deformed. I knew that I didn't have much time to think, so I took the only option I had. I jumped off the roof expecting the concrete that would probably break all of my bones. But it didn't. As I landed on solid ground, I turned back to gaze at the crumbling hotel. It stood as a testament to the horrors that lurked within, a place forever tainted by the suffering of lost souls. With a mixture of relief and sorrow, I watched as the entire structure collapsed into itself, consumed by its own malevolence. At this point my body couldn't resist more and fell to the ground. I woke up at the hospital and I saw a paper on the desk. Hey, I saw you did a great job at our hotel because we saw you have lots of skills to survive at night. So that's why we want to offer you a second job. We'll call you soon and don't forget to join us. Emily is with us. We are still here. Second story. I encountered a Wendigo while making a remote border crossing. We've got crows back at home. In my town we see them every day. Sometimes solo, sometimes in a group. I am well aware that a group of crows is referred to as a murder, but despite this ominous label, they're pretty shy and generally fly away at the first sign of danger. But the pair of big black birds circling the point across the lake were something else entirely. I know that around the Canadian border ravens become more common than crows, and this is what I suppose they were. But these were really big, too big, possibly bigger than an eagle. And as they circled the point, the calls they made were unnerving. Nothing like the caw of a crow. The sounds were screeching drawn-out croaks, as though to make sure that every creature on the lake was aware of their presence. I kept quiet from my vantage point 200 yards across the bay, and the travelers I had in my charge knew enough to keep still and silent. We were three quarters done with our journey that had begun at a clandestine location outside of Atikokan. I never thought I could become a smuggler, but here I was, tucked under ancient white pines with a man and woman who were essentially strangers to me. They watched the huge birds with me, whispering back and forth in their native language. I don't know what they were saying, but the look in their eyes showed their fear. And these people have seen things in their homeland bad enough for them to leave with nothing more than a few possessions, and then give all of their money to a stranger who arranged for me to take them through the wilderness to cross the most remote section of the largest unguarded border in the world. Traveling by canoe along a route that my ancestors have traveled since long before there was a border, we had crossed the imaginary line last night, and by this time tomorrow I planned to load them into a van that would be waiting at a trailhead near Ely. This was where we would part ways. 
For now, we were preparing to break camp at a campsite known only to me. I carved it out of the timber a few years ago, and it is able to conceal not only a tent but a canoe as well. There's not much canoe traffic this time of year, but I was doing a final check to make sure the coast was clear when the birds showed up. Figuring there must be something along the shore holding their interest, I fished my binoculars out of my pack to get a closer look at the sinister pair. To the naked eye, it looked like a typical rocky point on a shield lake. A smooth rock shoreline gave way to a stand of sparse bulrushes with a couple of boulders. One of the boulders didn't look right. I realized that I was actually looking at a dead moose that had floated up there. Likely a casualty from the moose season that ended the week before. That explained why the pair of birds were circling, and I pulled the binoculars away to study how the birds were behaving. They took turns swooping down low over the moose and then soaring higher than the treetops and letting out their disturbing calls. Then there was movement in the trees. I pulled the binoculars back up and focused in on the mix of birch and fur that was along the shoreline. At first I thought it was a bear, coming down to take advantage of the dead moose. But this was far taller than a bear. Then I saw the antlers. Some smaller trees parted, and then what at first I thought was a moose stepped to the water's edge. I've seen hundreds of moose in my time up here, but what I was seeing now didn't make sense. Sure it had antlers, and it was tall like a moose, but it was mostly without fur, and the color was all wrong, more of a sickly pinkish gray than the dark brown you would expect of a moose. I could see its ribs, and its front legs weren't really legs, they were more like long, gangly arms. Arms that ended in long bony fingers. Even though I was about 200 yards away I could see the glint of fangs. It stepped from the trees to the water's edge. It paused and looked up at the circling birds. It let out a scream that hung in the air. One of my travelers let out a whimper, and I turned put a raised finger across my lips. I knew we were out of sight of what any typical animal or person could see, but this was far from typical. I flashed back to many years before when I stared wide-eyed at my grandfather as he told stories around the campfire. Flames flickered and birch logs crackled as he described an evil spirit called the Wendigo. Many generations ago a lost hunter turned to cannibalism to survive and his evil deed transformed him into a horrific beast. A beast that roamed the wilds with an insatiable hunger for flesh, human or otherwise. While this story terrified me as a child, I never gave it any thought as an adult, as the elders had many tales of spirits and such. But here I was, miles from the nearest road, two strangers in my care, looking at the impossible. I subconsciously reached to feel the outline of my revolver tucked into the back of my pants. The beast had now waded into the water, and its claws began tearing at the moose carcass. It ripped off huge chunks of flesh, hide, and bone with ease, shoving them into his gaping mouth where they were crunched and swallowed. The water around the moose carcass was soon tinged red with blood, and the pair of giant birds took roost in a tall pine above the beast. The carnage continued as the creature consumed impossible amounts in minutes. I heard one of the travelers whisper, Monstoro? I didn't need translation to know what it meant. They had every reason to be scared now. I've had face-to-face -face standoffs with wild bears, with big city gangs, with angry fathers. At least with those you have an idea of what you are dealing with. My grandfather never said how one would deal with a wendigo. With most of the moose consumed, the monster let out another scream. I was back to looking through binoculars, which was a mistake as the beast's face and chest were covered in blood, and flesh clung to its claws. An image I will never be able to erase. Despite having consumed the better part of an adult moose, it was still gaunt in appearance. It took a last look around, and I stopped breathing when its gaze seemed to focus on our location for a moment. 
it slowly turned towards shore and then disappeared into the brush. This cued the blackbirds to come down for what was left. One bird rested on the moose's hindquarter and picked away at intestines. The other rested on the head and feasted on the eyes and torn open neck. After a few minutes they flew up silently, circled over our location, and then headed in the general direction the Wendigo had gone. At least they went in the opposite direction we were headed. We sat in silence for a time, then I pulled out a map. I showed the travelers where we were where the Wendigo had gone, and where we needed to go to complete the journey. I showed them my gun, which I had kept hidden from them until now, hoping it would ease their fears. It didn't do much to ease my fears. It was a .357 revolver, enough to stop a bear, but what would it do to a Wendigo? I suspected there needed to be some version of a silver bullet to stop an evil spirit. I gestured to them to pack their belongings, which they did quickly and quietly. I calculated that if we traveled lightly and quickly we could be out by nightfall. I decided to leave the tent and everything else not essential. We slid the canoe down the bank, climbed in and pushed off. The woman sat on the floor in the middle. The man was at the bow. I paddled from the stern with intensity we had about 10 miles to the end of the lake. At the end of the lake was a portage trail of about a half mile that would bring us to the next lake. We had done a number of portages already on this trip, and after the morning's events I was dreading having to be on foot. There was no other way out. A light wind was at our back, allowing for relatively quick travel. The man was paddling as best he could, but it was marginally helpful at best. The woman kept her head down and did not move. Usually on this kind of trip I try to hug the shoreline to keep a low profile, but now we were tracking right down the middle of the lake. I was making a beeline for a height of land where I knew the portage was, and we continued along in silence. The paddle down the long lake was uneventful, and it was early afternoon when we reached the portage. Once ashore we took a short break and ate some jerky, and then it was time to make the portage. It would be easier now since I had abandoned most of the gear. On earlier portages I had the travelers hide out while I scouted ahead to make sure we would not meet anyone on the trail, but there was no time for that. I think they understood me as I tried to explain the importance of moving quickly and quietly. I pointed to the trail and then to the packs and paddles. They took the cue and I put the canoe up on my shoulders, and we plodded along through the forest. It took less than an hour to get to the next lake. There was a forest fire here several years before, and the charred remains of a few old growth pine stood in stark contrast to the young aspen, birch and spruce that had grown in the void left by the fire. This lake was smaller, with many bays and points, and we were soon back to making progress in the canoe. When E5, we came around a point midway down the lake. I looked to the end of the lake where we would find the next portage and stopped padding. Maybe 300 yards away was the remains of a burnt pine. Roosting in the tree were two birds. Big, black birds. The man in the bow saw them too and muttered something to the woman. She looked up for the first time and stifled a scream. We had to go past them to get to the next portage so I kept paddling down the middle, not taking my eyes off the birds. As we got closer it was obvious they were watching us too, their heads pivoting as we passed them. I kept looking back over my shoulder at them, but they held their position. I didn't know what the presence of the birds on our route signified, but based on what I saw this morning it couldn't be good. By the time we were at the end of lake where the next portage was, I could barely make out the tree anymore. I thought that perhaps we were in the clear, but then we all heard the unmistaken sound, the same sound we heard the birds making this morning. Even though they had to be over a mile away, there was no mistaking it. The long, drawn-out croaking continued for a minute, then it was silent again. I paddled towards shore so hard that the bow slid two feet onto the bank. Go! 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 I yelled. 
The travelers seemed shocked at my yelling, as I had not said anything to them in the few days we had been together that wasn't a whisper. They both scrambled out of the canoe, grabbed the gear and headed up the path. I again wrestled the canoe onto my shoulders and followed. We still had another lake to cross after this portage. Then it was down a creek to where we were to be picked up in a remote parking lot at the end of a forest road. We would be early, but maybe I could get a cell phone signal and get a call or text to the driver. Or maybe we could hitch a ride with a tourist. Any concerns of being intercepted by authorities has now taken a back seat to getting out of here and away from that thing that for all I knew was making its way south toward us. Since we were closer to an access point, this mile-long portage was well-traveled and we made good time. The first half was up a slight incline, then it went down much more steeply to the next lake. We reached the top and paused for a quick rest. I set the canoe down to catch my breath. The crest of the trail allowed a good view of the valley ahead. It also allowed a good view of two huge, black birds that were circling above the treetops. The woman was not able to stifle her scream this time, and this prompted the birds to start up with their ominous calls. In the distance we heard another sound. It was a scream. A scream that could have only come from the horror we had seen this morning. While I felt a certain amount of responsibility to the travelers, my concern for them was waning. You better keep up. I yelled as hoisted the canoe back onto my shoulders. I headed down the steep trail as fast as I could, and I could hear the travelers behind me, stumbling but not falling too far behind. With the canoe on my shoulders, I couldn't see if they were carrying the paddles. Didn't matter. I keep a spare strap to the supports in the canoe. The steep path made a switchback and was able to see that the man was indeed carrying a paddle and pack. The woman was crying hysterically, carrying nothing. The path here was steep and rough, with many large rocks and roots creating potential tripping hazards. The birds were circling overhead us now, their croaks echoing off the hillside. We heard the distant scream again, although this time it didn't sound so distant. It was not possible for us to move any faster, but I took care to be sure-footed. I could see we were nearly to the bottom of the hill. Once there it would be level ground to the next lake, which was now only a few hundred yards away. I made it to the bottom of the hill where the well-worn path went through a series of large roots and then turned to dirt. Once to the dirt I flipped the canoe off my shoulders and let it land on the hull. The travelers were coming up fifty yards behind me. I grabbed the bow of the canoe and started dragging it, hoping the man would catch up and grab the stern. I started to yell at the couple to hurry, but I was interrupted by another scream from the beast. It was coming from our right, and I could now hear branches breaking and what sounded like breathing and snarling. There was no reason to think that the lake would offer refuge from this thing, but it seemed like a better option than facing it here on the path. The man was almost caught up to me, but he stopped to see where his partner was. She had tripped on a root and was now screaming, not sure if it was in pain or terror. Probably more terror as the Wendigo had broken through the brush along the trail and was now fifty feet behind her. She looked back at it and let out what she meant to be a scream but came out as a yelp. The beast was on her in seconds, and it picked her up over its head and slammed her to the ground. The man dropped to his knees, watching in horror as his partner was torn apart and devoured. Wendy ate I resumed dragging the canoe as fast as I could, not looking back. The beast let out another shriek. Then there was a scream that I presumed to be from the man. I tried not to think about the snapping and crunching sounds I could hear from behind me. The next lake was now in sight, and even though my entire body wanted to quit I was now running. The shoreline was sandy and I ran right into the water, allowing the canoe to float past me. I hopped in when the back seat was even with me, and in one motion pulled the tag end of the knot that held my spare paddle in place. 
A few quick strokes and I was twenty yards from shore. The screams of the beast continued, and the black birds that had been watching the bloodbath from treetops now were starting to swoop around me, getting closer with each pass. The wendigo was now on the shoreline, and it let out the loudest scream of all. It stepped in the water to its knees but stopped, gesturing with its long arms and howling at the sky. Not knowing what to do next, I pulled out my revolver. At the end of this lake was the outlet stream that would lead me to a bridge. For the moment I felt safer where I was. The birds were getting ever bolder, and I could feel the wind as one of them swooped in on me from behind my shoulder. It wheeled around over the bow and came right back at me. It reared back at arm's length with its wings spread and its talons coming right at my face. Taking advantage of a perfect opportunity, one pointed the gun barrel at the bird's center and pulled the trigger. Black feathers flew and the now silenced bird landed in the water and strangely sank out of sight. The other bird flew up high and then quickly descended, coming right at me. I had the gun raised, but the bird did not offer a good target and it flew past my head. Sensing weakness, it circled around and attacked, pecking me on the back of the head with its massive beak. I had to be careful not to tip as I tried to fend it off with the paddle. More determined than ever, the bird came back at me. I fired twice, missing both times. With three rounds left in the gun, I knew I better choose my next shots carefully. The bird came from behind me again. This time it wheeled around quickly, planting its talons on my chest and pecking at my eyes. My attempts to fend it off with a fist were not successful and it got a hold of my eyebrow. I could feel flesh pulling away from my skull and I pointed the gun right at it and even though I thought the barrel was pressed right into it I still missed. I resorted to using the gun as a bludgeon that I slammed into its neck. This had a noticeable effect. It let out a deep croak and let go its grip. I was not watching the wendigo at this point, focused on the dark, feathered assailant. I could hear it though, as it let out shrieks and screams louder than a siren. The remaining black bird shook up some from the pistol whipping, flew in a crooked path now, obviously having difficulty maintaining its course. I felt confident I could take it down with one of my remaining rounds. It came straight at me. I let it peck the top of my head as it went by. It circled around again, and once more I let it get me with a good peck to my temple. It made another loop around, and I was ready when it followed the same path of attack. It came right at me, and I was looking down the barrel right at the bird's head when I pulled the trigger. The raven's head disintegrated in a cloud of black feathers and blood and the headless body landed at my feet. Wings still flapping, talons still grasping. The shrieks of the wendigo suddenly stopped. It stood motionless, staring out at the lake, not necessarily at me. I set the gun on the seat next to me. There was still one round left. I used the paddle as a shovel to lift the dead bird over the side and into the lake, where it too strangely sank out of sight. The wendigo, while still a fearsome-looking beast with its face and claws covered in blood and flesh, had lost its menacing posture. I pointed the revolver at it, right at its head. I was confident I could hit it, not confident that my one remaining bullet would kill it. For some reason I thought about the old saying, that if carrying a handgun for bear protection you should save the last round for yourself. Pretty sure the old saying applies here. I lowered the gun and watched the beast. With its long bony arms hanging at its sides it turned towards shore and with two big steps it was crashing through the timber, heading away from the lake, away from me, away from my exit point. I sat quietly for a minute trying to take all of this in. I could no longer hear the sounds of branches breaking. Was the wendigo gone? Apparently they can't, or won't swim. The ravens must act as seers or scouts for the wendigo. Once they were eliminated it was like a switch was flipped. I thought about the hapless travelers. 
I knew it was pointless to go back to where I had last seen them. What would happen to me when I left the lake? It was now late in the afternoon. I slid the revolver with its one bullet into the back of my jeans, picked up the paddle, and headed for the outlet creek. Third story. My new flat is haunted by ghosts, and I'm not sure what to do. Hey Reddit. I need your help. I recently moved into a new flat, but it seems like I'm not the only one who's taken up residence here. There are ghosts lurking in the shadows, and I'm not sure how to get rid of them. It all started a few weeks ago. At first, it was just small things. I would hear footsteps in the hallway, even though I was alone in my flat. Doors would open and close by themselves. I would catch glimpses of shadowy figures out of the corner of my eye. But things have gotten worse. Much worse. The ghosts have started to show themselves more openly. I've seen them in my dreams, with their pale faces and empty eyes. They whisper to me in the dark, telling me to give in to their power. And then there are the physical manifestations. My possessions are being moved around, as if by an unseen force. Objects are falling off shelves and tables for no reason. And worst of all, I've started to feel their touch. It's like a cold hand gripping my shoulder, or a breath on the back of my neck. I can't see them, but I can feel them all around me. I've tried to get help. I've called in priests, psychics, and paranormal investigators. But no one has been able to help me. The ghosts seem to be too strong, too powerful for anyone to handle. I'm not sure what to do next. I feel like I'm losing my mind. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm constantly on edge, waiting for the next attack. Last night, I saw one of the ghosts more clearly than ever before. It was a young girl, with long black hair and a tattered dress. She looked like she was crying, and when I tried to approach her, she vanished into thin air. I did some research and found out that a young girl died in this flat many years ago. Her name was Emily, and she was only six years old. I don't know if it's her that's haunting me, but I can't shake the feeling that she's trying to tell me something. Reddit, please help me. I am writing this on a notepad at the moment and will update over the next couple of days before I post. I need more information on what exactly is going on here. Date. Hey Reddit, it's me again. I wanted to give you all an update on my situation with the ghosts in my flat. Things have taken a turn for the worse, and I'm really starting to fear for my safety. As I mentioned in my previous post, I've been experiencing strange occurrences in my flat for weeks now. Doors opening and closing, objects moving on their own, and a feeling of being constantly watched. But last night, things escalated to a whole new level. I was lying in bed, trying to get to sleep, when I heard a strange noise coming from my living room. It sounded like something was scratching at the walls. I got up to investigate, and that's when I saw it. One of the ghosts, a woman with long, stringy hair and a twisted expression, was standing in the middle of my living room. She was scratching at the walls with her long, sharp nails, leaving deep gouges in the plaster. I tried to run back to my bedroom, but she was too fast. She lunged at me, and I felt her icy grip around my neck. I struggled to break free, but it was like she was made of stone. Eventually, I managed to wriggle free and ran to the door. But when I tried to open it, it wouldn't budge. It was like the ghost was holding it shut from the other side. I was trapped, alone in my flat with a vengeful ghost. I thought I was going to die. But then, just as suddenly as it had started, the ghost disappeared. The door swung open, and I stumbled out into the hallway, gasping for air. I don't know what to do. The ghosts in my flat are getting more aggressive by the day, and I'm starting to feel like I'm in real danger. I've tried everything to get rid of them, but nothing has worked. I feel like I'm running out of options. Reddit, please help me. I need your advice. How can I get rid of these ghosts before it's too late? 
Fourth story, Wendigo Encounter. After hearing stories and looking stuff up online, I'm fairly sure it was a Wendigo. Me, my son and girlfriend were attacked by something. We were camping up in the northernmost area of Washington. My girlfriend is incredibly superstitious, so she insisted we brought weapons. So I had my combat knife and a 12-gauge shotgun, and she brought a .22 rifle alongside a newly sharpened machete. Our son was just three years old at the time. She and I were set on edge from a park ranger, who seemed very tense and uneasy, who stopped us and instead of confiscating our weapons told us to be careful and stay safe, then sent us along our way to the camp. When we got there we were informed that several visitors had spoken about some unnatural noises and a pale creature that would mimic voices and sounds of people who weren't talking or seeming to be distracted. I laughed and put the idea out my mind, thinking to myself there's no way. They're fucking with us. But I knew better. So we then reached the area we were going to set up camp. We immediately got a fire ready to light and set up our tent and bags. I fed my son as my girlfriend ate a snack. We decided to get a lay of the area, so me and my girlfriend hiked around for about an hour or so. I had one of those baby carrying backpacks and my son started to get real heavy. Everything seemed normal until I saw something down the almost path we were on. We walked closer to investigate and saw drag marks. It looked as if someone had killed a buck. There was a whole outline in the dirt with a small dried pool of blood, as if someone grabbed it from the antlers and pulled. That wouldn't be possible for any man to do, the buck, or whatever it was would have been way too big for that. Shaken, we rushed back to base camp and restarted the fire and hurried back into our tent. Too afraid to leave since it was dusk by now we stayed inside the tent and my girlfriend put our son to bed. Eventually, probably from the exhaustion of fright we fell asleep. What must have been hours later I awoke to a faint rasping sound that sounded like a child crying. I gazed outside in confusion and saw the outline of a creature that seemed to be a buck, standing over something. It seemed to be about 20 feet away, but at a closer glance had unnaturally long limbs for a buck, and was eerily tall. In sudden fear, I unloaded two shots into the creature and heard a loud blood-curdling see or why dumb, why girlfriend awoke, screaming to the shots I had fired as I tried to explain what I had heard. To my surprise, the animal hadn't moved an inch. Then I noticed the stains on the side of the animal. It looked like blood was running down the edge, and lots of it. It stared at me deep into my eyes as I became petrified with fear. A sinister feeling of dread fell over me as if it knew I couldn't move. I thought to myself, what if it starts to bolt towards us? Just then, this tall, decrepit demonic thing seemed to whisper something. I couldn't exactly tell what it was saying, but it seemed to have said, I need more, children. My girlfriend screamed asking where our son was. We blacked out. In the morning we awoke to park rangers at our campsite. We didn't see our son anywhere. We told the rangers that he was missing and they started a search party. I explained what had happened and strangely they seemed to believe it. The one who seemed to be older by at least a decade pulled along the one we met earlier and whispered in his ear. I only heard a single line and I'm not even sure if what I heard was correct. It sounded like he said, it's getting bolder. They didn't seem to want us by ourselves, so they waited with us while they continued the search. We stayed in a log cabin for three days with a forest ranger. When suddenly some rangers came into the cabin saying they couldn't find our son. My girlfriend starts to sob. I start to hate myself thinking that I could have done something if I wasn't frozen in fear. We rushed outside only to find some injured and frightened police officials. The rangers wouldn't tell us anything of what happened or what they saw, or why the cops were scared shitless. All we know is that we don't have a son anymore. God help whoever goes into that forest next, and please please don't bring your kids with you. Fifth Story 
My childhood friend is haunting me. On the first day of high school, I received a concise letter from my best friend letting me know that I was no longer cool enough to be her friend. It read not unlike a letter of termination from a job, and I later learned that it had been generic because it had been sent to three other people. This left me relatively friendless, and in retrospect desperate to meet new people. Maybe that's why when a girl two years older than me with a shaved head and drawn-on cat whiskers told me she knew me from somewhere in my second class of the day, we were immediately attached at the hip. She was loud, vibrant, and probably the most fearless person I ever met. She was weird. Make no mistake there. But her eccentricities only added to her charisma. She wore a Halloween costume corset half the time and sang show tunes out loud in the hallways. I'd always been a bit of a prude and she had told me stories about drinking and boys. I was absolutely transfixed. Her name was Veronica. It wasn't, but for the purpose of this story, it was. She got me hooked on musical theater and I began writing songs about her. She was a firecracker, but with her high points, her beautiful unrestrained chaos came equally intense lows. And as we grew closer, as she came to need me like I needed her, 14-year-old me was woefully unprepared to help her. How do you talk someone through a pregnancy scare when you've never had a boyfriend? How do you help with abusive parents or an alcohol addiction or an eating disorder when you're just barely out of middle school? I didn't stand a chance. We went on a school field trip once and stopped at a restaurant on the way home. She ordered the smallest meal she could, and on the drive home, she admitted that if she'd been alone, she wouldn't have eaten at all. I held her, crying, in my arms. She kissed me gently, still weeping, and I was afraid. So, so afraid of how that kiss had made me feel, terrified of being isolated by my peers. The next day I told my friends, and to avoid suspicion my comments bordered on homophobic. I'm not proud of this, but I was clinging desperately to the hope that separating her from me would drag my peers' suspicions away. In doing so, I betrayed her at one of the worst times in her life. Our friendship recovered, but was never the same. I watched her spiral in real time. Watched his happiness turn to mania and sadness turn to depression. When I was 15 and she was 17, she told me about coke binges, about self-harm, about sleeping with men just to feel something. At some point, she got a steady boyfriend. When she told me she was hitting him, that was the last straw. I told myself I wouldn't be her friend anymore. She reached out to me repeatedly and I stopped responding. She cut out her other friends, broke up with her boyfriend, and in early January she waited until her mom had left for work and hung herself. At the time, I'd never been to a funeral. I don't know how many I've been to now, but a crowd of actual children dressed in black and giving eulogies for another child is something that has burned itself into my memory. Her parents were there. One of them told us that her untimely death was inevitable that by being her friend we'd simply bought them more time. I remember thinking that it was absolute bullshit. Each of us could have done something, had we reached out more, had we not betrayed her. I don't even remember the school year after that. It's a time in my life that is just gone. Vanished, like she did. People look at you differently when you're in mourning, act differently. Especially as a teenager in mourning. People I'd never spoken to reached out to give their condolences. Looking back I understand that it was what they thought I wanted. Some kind of comfort, but I remember being frustrated by the attention and fake kinship. I remember wishing more than anything to be left alone, and I often retreated to the comfort of my bedroom just to avoid sympathy from anyone I knew. The isolation I felt was immeasurable. For months later, when I could speak her name without sobbing, I went back to my old notes. I went back to the ambitious musical my younger self had started writing, the one based on her. Starring her. That was the first night that it started. 
I had fallen asleep reading my old notes and was shaken gently awake by Veronica. She looked the same as I remembered her. Her dark shaved hair, her wild pale blue eyes. When I brought myself to look at her neck it looked exactly as it had in life. Not a single scratch on her. I was, obviously, bewildered. But I ultimately realized that accepting that she was here left me a lot happier than questioning why she would be. She smiled at me, cold hands still resting on my shoulder. Right? Came a voice that sounded like wind. She hadn't opened her mouth. Silently, she picked up a paper from the stack that surrounded me, and the voice came again. Right? It was more forceful this time. More concrete as if the first command had simply been to test her voice. And so I picked up a pencil and I did. The song I had been working on was incomplete. I added a verse. She stayed seated at the foot of my bed, watching and still smiling. I tested our verses and choruses, made notes in the margins about characters and staging. I could swear that as I wrote, I could see her eyes glowing. When I finished the song, I went back to dreamless slumber, glancing every so often at the dead girl that sat still at the foot of my bed, still smiling. I woke the next day feeling like I hadn't slept at all, but this was nothing new. I hadn't slept well in months. I went to school and dealt with the pitying stares of my peers. In my third period, when the teacher was droning on and I couldn't bear to comprehend another word, I heard it again clear as day. Right? I jolted upright. No one else seemed to notice the disembodied voice. But I realized that if this truly was Veronica, and what she really wanted was for me to write about her, I would oblige even if no one else heard her. I began the framework for a new song, a ballad for the character Veronica would have played. I wrote about her pain and found myself crying hot tears in class. The teacher gave me a glance that let me know they understood and dismissed me. After splashing some cold water in my face, I returned to class and paid attention to the lecture this time. That night, she was there again when I fell asleep, but different. I couldn't put my finger on it until I stood up to get my notebook and realized that she was taller than me by a good few inches. In life, she had been almost exactly my height. Maybe she had appeared as she wanted to look, but then why would she keep the shaved hair she hadn't liked, or the body she so desperately wished to be smaller? I let it go, chalking it up to simple misremembering. I hadn't stood next to her in months, so it made sense that little details could be wrong, like her eyes, just a shade too pale, or her hair a bit shorter than it had ever been, and that eerie smile. Hers had always been warm, at least. In death, her smile was toothy and wide, unrelenting. A gesture of welcome with no goodwill behind it. Can anyone other than me see you? I asked aloud. She was utterly silent. Is there any reason in particular you chose me? I asked again. Right. She commanded, and I obliged. I went back to the solo I'd been working on earlier and revised some lyrics. She seemed happy with this, eyes again seeming to glow as I fell back to sleep. It continued on for months. Any spare moment, the second my attention was not on whatever was at hand I heard her. I trudged through junior year. I began to think of it as almost a gift. As someone who rarely has complete focus, the concept of a constant reminder to work on my project was all too enticing. I grew to appreciate her presence, feel almost comforted by it, and she grew in a different way. Every night she seemed taller, proportionate still, but bigger and bigger, towering over me. She loomed at the edge of my bed, or sitting in the chair in the corner, or once hiding in my closet. She was omnipresent and it was a welcome distraction for my grief. Life continued on. I trudged through my junior year and wrote every night, never getting any amount of genuine sleep. I was sluggish in school, and my grades were suffering from sheer exhaustion. 
When I was nearly happy with my music and lyrics and characters, I compiled them into a notebook. I gave them to the woman who now took up a whole corner of my room, and she flipped through it with her comically large hands. When she was done, her unnerving smile faltered and finally split into an equally bizarre mask of sadness. Are you really sure you're ready to be done? said the voice, Veronica's stretched lips unmoving from her horrible frown. I realized with a start two things. The first was that if I stopped writing, I would stop seeing her. The second was that she was right. The plot was one that was well written for a 14-year-old, but not by any means professional. It felt like a child's story, oversimplified and dramatic without purpose. I looked up into her ice-blue eyes. I didn't remember them looking that cold in life, and took the notebook away, promising to do better. The summer before my senior year, I started on a novel. It had similar characters to the musical, but the plot had been reworked into something that I thought seemed more articulate, more clear-cut. The night I told her that I was beginning it, her wide smile seemed even larger. I could practically feel her drinking in each word I wrote as her eyes glowed at the end of each night. Friends started asking why I was spending less time with them, and I had no way to tell them that my time was being taken up writing for my friend. To what end? I had no clue. After 30,000 words, Veronica had to bend to fit in my bedroom. When she read my work at the end of each night, her smile grew somehow wider, and at this point I felt that I could very easily fit in her wide, gaping mouth. It was grotesque in a way that was almost distracting, but her face remained beautiful, just wrong, no longer human, but I guess I never assumed the entity in my room was. When I came to the final chapter, I showed her the printed out pages and she read them, sitting still for a solid hour. At the end, her even larger mouth made the disturbing grimace I remembered, and I knew what she was thinking. The writing had been good, but could always be better. The images in my head had been so clear it was easy to assume everyone understood them as I described, and I sometimes lacked the detail that made a story realistic. The dialogue had been edgy, and trying too hard to sound smart. When I thought about going back through, editing the hundreds of pages, a sting of pain filled me. I was so tired. I would have given anything to get a good night's sleep, but I persisted and continued to write for her. At some point, I thought that maybe a book was the wrong format altogether. I found that dialogue without descriptions proved to be my strong suit, and I got into playwriting. I didn't write the same fictionalized account of her life, filled with fantasy, but a realistic timeline of our friendship and her death. At this point I was in college. Each night, she filled my room, silent and smiling. Each night I wrote tributes for her. Each night I grew a little more afraid. The transformation had happened so slowly that it seemed natural, but she looked less and less human every day. Her eyes were blue dots in her head, her mouth an endlessly wide and toothy grin. Her face was poreless and smooth like a porcelain doll. It was disquieting, but she had motivated me to do some of my best work, and her story was the first thing I could focus on. Didn't that give her some amount of credibility? Halfway through the newest play, four years after her death, I couldn't take it anymore. A long breaking point I know, but I was scared that if I took a night off she'd leave and wouldn't come back. After four years, some rest would have been almost worth it. I bought a blindfold and noise-canceling headphones and wrapped myself in a cocoon of blankets. I needed to get some sleep before it literally killed me. Ominous writing deadlines be damned. The moment I drifted off I found myself in a beautiful park surrounded by trees. I looked up to find myself sitting on a bench next to a serene and very human-looking Veronica. The thing in my room looked clownish in comparison, a very poor replacement for her. She was warm to the touch, content 
and beautiful. She smiled and I had no idea how I could call the thing's cartoonish grimace a smile. I leaned in and finally hugged her. I didn't know where to begin now that she was finally here. I asked her if she was happy, and she reassured me that she was. I asked if she had seen what was going on in the world, and she said she hadn't. I asked her how that could be when she'd been in my room every night, and this gave her pause. She looked at me in a way I'll never forget, the same way my peers had looked at me whenever they saw me for the following year, pityingly. Listen to me, she said. Whatever has been visiting you is not me. I hold no grudge, keep no burden that I held in life. The thing that keeps you writing about your pain is not doing so to help me, but to feed on you. I do not want you to wallow, but to thrive. With that, she kissed my forehead and walked away. I knew that it was our final goodbye, and I made peace with it. A meaningful exit is not always a given, and until that point the only closure I'd received had been from the thing that haunted my room. The park melted away around me, and I opened my eyes to see the ghoulish portrait of Veronica making eye contact with me. Right? The voice that was not Veronica's roared, and one last time, I did. I told the story of Veronica and her beautiful impact on my life, of the sadness that followed, and of the thing that kept me wallowing in sadness and self-pity. When I was fully and completely done, I handed the thing the handwritten paper and watched it read. Are you sure you want to end it here? Seems rather incomplete. The voice was nothing like hers. How could I have possibly believed this lie? I knew the answer was simply that I had wanted to. Yes. I said, simply. Pathetic. It cried, ripping the paper in half, clearly vying for rewrites. I don't care. I said, I'm going back to sleep. It looked at me with that drooping frown, practically melting off its face, and as I watched, it shrunk a foot. Poorly worded. It said, its voice a bit more panicked. It shrank again. Bizarre. Just plain weird. It shrank again. Don't quit your day job. It wailed, about my height at this point. My silence was deafening. It shot downward, smaller and smaller as its insults grew into meaningless threats and eventually just screaming. When it was small enough, I crushed it under my notebook like a bug and swept the remains into the trash. Veronica, the real Veronica, was dead. But wherever she was, she was at peace. When I was finally able to sleep, I'd see her every so often in dreams. She looked happier than she had in life. I truly hoped she'd meant what she had said about releasing her earthly burdens. When I finally found the distinction between wallowing and honoring, for once I found myself inspired to create something new.